Hello, everybody. Sorry for some technical difficulties here. I did not have uh, my browser and all that sort of stuff loaded up. Hopefully, y'all can hear me. And we can start presenting on how options flows can help move markets. So I see there, Mizra, on my screen share. Uh, make sure I get this going. All right, sweet. Okay, so uh, I wanted to touch on a couple of ideas. Uh, first, a little bit of background um, about me after I tell you what we're talking about today. So the idea is that options flows move markets. And I contend that if you are not watching options order flows, then you are missing how a large influence in markets. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brent Kachuba. I founded Spot Gamma in January of 2020. And everything that I do is about trying to convey how options flows move underlying stocks and futures. So we have a variety of members at SpotGamma.com who trade futures, who trade stocks, and also a lot of people who trade options. And um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the general theory around how options move markets. So if you've heard terms like gamma, theta, vega, charm, some of those fancier sounding Greek terms, I'm hopefully here to break those down for you. Uh, again, I launched January. Uh, I launched Spot Game in January of 2020, and I spent uh, most of my career before that at large banks like Bank of America, Credit Suisse. I worked for an options market maker. Uh, I was a broker there called Wolverine, which some of you may have heard of. And then I worked for a family office trading the S&P 500. And it was through all this experience I came to understand how options flows can move uh, stocks. So uh, for those of you who have questions, I see Hannah and for example, you put in a question, I will check those off at the end as I kind of pop through this presentation. Uh, and I encourage a lot of you to join us on December 7th, that's tomorrow, as uh, John comes on to explain some of the ways that he uses this. So I think this will be a good primer for understanding how options order flows move markets. Okay. On your screen here is US options volumes. And as you can see, particularly that blue bar, those blue bars, uh, in January of, two, excuse me, in 2020, I keep saying January, but it's just in 2020, options volumes really exploded. And the driver behind that uh, was commission-free trading and access to apps like uh, Robinhood that really kind of democratized access to options uh, flows. And so in January of 2020, uh, I believe is when those uh, commission free trades started. And then there was a huge explosion until another January that was meme mania in 2021. And so there's been these rolling episodes of giant uh, spikes in options volumes. Now, 90% is what I'm uh, told from an options panel recently, 90% plus of options trades that you and I do, the counterparty on those trades are options market makers. And there's only about six or seven actually large options market makers. In fact, if you uh, Google this, Citadel has said in the past that they've done somewhere around, around 40 to 45% of options trades themselves. So there's a very concentrated group of individuals on the other side of the trades that we're doing every day. And they, when they're trading, they're accruing risk, right? They're uh, buying and selling calls and puts all day long, and they need to hedge that risk. And the way that they do that is they're trading in the underlying shares or trading futures. And so that is the transmission mechanism between how options are trading and how the underlying stocks uh, are moving in accordance with these big options volumes. So the idea here is that more options volumes should lead to larger hedging flows. I thought this was a very interesting quote from Steve Sosnick. This came out around the time of meme mania, but he basically said, hey, you know, in sports betting, the amount of bets that may occur on, you know, the Cowboys or the Red Sox or whatever it is, that that doesn't influence the game. It changes the odds, but not the game itself. However, with options, because of this hedging flow, the increase in number of bets, the number of people buying calls or buying puts actually can change the way the stock trades. So when you and I go and buy more shares, uh, excuse me, buy more call options, that can make the stock rally as a function of these hedging flows. Whereas if we all buy whatever uh, bets that the uh, 49ers will win the Super Bowl, they don't have a better chance at winning the Super Bowl uh, as a result of that. Okay, so let's break down how this works a little bit. For example, if you and I, uh, Hannah, for example, or Cody or whomever is on our laptops at home and we all say, great, let's buy some AMC calls. We log into Thinkorswim or Tasty Trade or E-Trade or Robinhood, whatever you're on. And if we all buy 10 calls, 
each, that in and of itself is not a lot of risk. It probably would trade and a market maker wouldn't blink their eye, right? Uh, when we put those orders in, they all go down to the US options exchanges. There are 16 US options exchanges and putting bids and offers out there are the market makers and they're required as a function of them being market makers to put bids and offers out there. You don't have to like the price they're willing to trade at, but they have to be willing to trade. And so when you and I are sitting there on our laptops and we all log into our accounts because of something that happened on Twitter X or Wall Street Bets or whatever, and we all buy teeny little calls as an example, suddenly the market maker may be sitting there and go, uh oh, I just sold 100,000 calls. Now it happens to be that there are 10,000 of us buying 10 lots, right? But that risk accrues and they suddenly have a problem. So what, is that, what do they do? Well, if they sold 100,000 calls to all of us, remember we bought them, so they had to short those calls. They don't have those calls in inventory generally, they had to sell those. That means that they suddenly have risk. So how much risk can that be? Well, in this example, if they sell 100,000 calls, we can use this measurement called delta to dictate or determine how many shares of stock they may have to buy. Now, delta is derived from a model like Black-Scholes model where you put in a bunch of parameters and outspits this number called delta. And that basically says, hey, for every call you sell, you got to buy 50 shares of stock. So that's where that delta number is derived from. Don't hang up on that. The key here is to note that those 10, 100,000 calls equates to 5 million shares of AMC stock to buy. Now, any of you who've watched a stock in a fast market would know that, hey, I can't sit and wait to buy these shares of stock because the stock like AMC, you know, in its prime trading day can swing 5, 10% intraday, right? It's a lot of risk moving around. So as a market maker or a dealer, I need to just jump in and get buying. And so you can imagine that if you were to suddenly have to buy 5 million shares of stock in a pretty short amount of time, well, you could move that stock pretty good. And so this is a very rough example of how uh, these options orders can move shares of stock. So let's talk about this idea of Delta. And a lot of people like to take a screenshot of this. And I know it's kind of getting into the weeds, but I think that if you understand this chart, it'll make things pretty clear. So in column A, this is the trader. So this is you or me sitting here. Hey, we want to buy calls or sell calls. Uh, this could also be a big hedge fund, right? Anybody that puts in an order that goes down electronically to an exchange, or if I were to pick up a phone and call, say, JP Morgan and say, hey, JP Morgan, uh, I want to buy 10,000 S&P 500 puts. And they say, great, here's your price. The hedging logic would generally work the same. So if I buy a call, for example, the dealer is selling the call or shorting the call. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and the way that they would hedge themselves is to buy stock. Now, why is that? Well, if, if I buy a stock a call and the stock goes up, great for me, but the dealer who shorted that call is going to be upset, right? Because that call is going to go against them in price. So they can hedge shares, hedge using shares of stock. And it's that delta figure, right? This delta figure that I mentioned here that determines how many shares of stock they'd have to buy on that initial order. So the minute, let's say it's Hannah there, that's the dealer, Brent buys a call, Hannah says, great, my delta of this call is 50. I sold the call, I'm gonna buy 50 shares of stock. I am now hedged, that's great. That dealer hedge, that initial hedge, we would call that the delta hedge. Now the other trick to this, for those of you who've ever heard of the idea of a, of a gamma squeeze, is that obviously we know that if AMC stock in this case continues to go up, let's say it rallies 1%, well your call, right, the call that Brent bought, uh, I'm feeling good because that call is gonna gain even in more value. Hannah's going to be upset because the call that she sold is going to be going against her even more. And that 50 shares of stock that she originally bought is probably not enough to keep up with the loss from her call, right? Because uh, if that call gets deeper in the money, it grows in value. And that 50 shares of stock that you have is just not enough. So you can plug in uh, out from that Black-Scholes model that I mentioned before, that options model that gives us this delta figure. They also tell us a figure called gamma and gamma tells us how many additional shares of stock I'd have to buy. So let's say the delta hedge that we originally mentioned, Hannah buys 50 shares of stock. If the stock goes up 1%, Hannah will buy another five shares of stock. And if the stock goes up another 1%, Hannah will buy another five shares of stock. That's the gamma component that a lot of people talk about. That's the idea of a gamma squeeze, right? You can imagine that dealers have to keep buying stock as the stock goes up, how that can continue uh, to drag momentum in a stock higher. Now, why does this matter for all of us? Well, if we know this basic underlying logic, you don't even have to know the math necessary, but if you get that logic, then when you're looking at something like our hero indicator or key gamma strikes as support and resistance, or if you're looking at 
call walls or put walls or these different metrics that we put out, you can understand that, hey, okay, I understand this is why these are major support and resistance levels because these underlying hedging flows that are laid out on your screen here, that's what gets invoked, right? I don't have to worry exactly how much delta it is because somebody like a spot gam or somebody's measuring uh, that information for me and, and can inform me of, of, uh, of the general theory behind uh, these options flows. Okay, so why do we care about gamma and delta? Well, this is the S&P 500 and across the x-axis here is the uh, strike price or the underlying price of the S&P 500 index. So as all of you know, uh, we're about 45.75 is uh, where I last look. I'll just make sure it's still accurate. And you'll see here in orange is what we call call gamma and in blue is put gamma. So why does that measure for, for why does that matter to us? Well, gamma, as we mentioned, is the amount, measures the amount of hedging flow that has to be adjusted, right, uh, uh, to hedge market. So as the stock market goes up, dealers got to sell some shares. As the market goes down, dealers have to buy some shares. And in particular, when the S&P 500 visits these levels that have these really big bars, hedging flows increase, and that's what makes these support and resistance areas. So I believe that I have a little pen tool. Maybe I don't. Um, so in this zone right here, you can see these bars are really, really big, right? And for those of you who've been tracking the S&P 500, you would note that we have been stuck precisely in this area, 4550, which is this bar here, to 4560, which is this bar here, for about two weeks now. And these bars are really, really big because these are tied to big options positions that don't expire to next week. And so when you have these big options bars, there's bigger hedging flows in the market. In this case, the S&P 500 gets more locked into this trading range. And so if you're aware of this and you're trading futures or you're trading spiders, you go, great, there's huge resistance at 4,600 based on this. And there's huge support based on 4,550. And we're just playing this game of ping pong. But how long should I play this game of ping pong for? Well, until these options positions change, and that's what helps us to forecast when uh, markets are about to break out or break down, for example. We're going to touch on that idea in a minute. Uh, but this idea of big hedging flows being support and resistance, we measure this at spotgamma.com on one of our index pages. So you can see a huge position at 4550, huge position at 4600, and this is locking us into where we are trading at the moment, uh, which is about 4560 in the S&P 500. Um, and as so there are videos that explain aspects of spot gamma. There are, for those of you who really want to get into the weeds of uh, this uh, logic of gamma and dealers buying and selling, I know I'm doing a very quick presentation here. We're going to offer a boot camp in January uh, in partner with Simpler Trading. What I like our partnership with Simpler Trading is that, you know, John is such a great trader and his ability to use this information uh, to position trades around it, I think is really invaluable. If you want kind of a, a quicker fix on a couple of key ideas you can check our uh, youtube page out youtube.com slash spot gamma but i really recommend people uh, check out the boot camp that's coming up uh, i'm sure uh, cody or maybe lauren could put a link uh, to that coming up uh, second question from dsi uh, is about hero and um, you wanted to look at some archive data and i can touch on that after this as well um, all right so this is the idea of gamma support and resistance lines uh, 4,600 incidentally has been this idea of our call wall. Our call wall has been at 4,600 for approximately 10 sessions. And it, many of you will have known, uh, or maybe have recognized at this point that the uh, S and P rejected off that level a couple of days ago and has remained pinned under that level since. Now, when would this change? Well, I would contend that, uh, we have non-farm payrolls coming up on Friday, which could create a little volatility. I don't think that's a big deal. We have CPI next week on the 12th. Then we have FOMC on the 13th, big events. And then we also have a giant options expiration, as I mentioned, on the 15th. Uh, and what essentially happens with that options expiration is all of these big positions that you see here, they get wiped out, right? About 30% to 50%, depending on exactly where and when you look those get wiped out, right? So suddenly these big bars that are support and resistance change to these little bars and that support and resistance that's locking us in this range go away. So if you're hoping for a big breakout here in the S&P 500 or you're betting that the market's gonna crash, if you wait until these options positions are set to expire or go away, that should free up the market to help to uh, for the market to sort of express itself in conjunction with how you're uh, viewing things. 
Uh, Big Voodoo Daddy mentions this idea of uh, the S&P trading slightly below the hedge wall. Is that meaningful? And how do I read that action intraday? Um, I'm happy to touch on that. Uh, and I'll take some more active questions. I guess I'll, I'll be able to change my screen and we can talk about some of the intraday mechanics of the market. Um, okay, so I mentioned this, how big the options expirations are. Uh, the orange bar here is the size of call positions in the S&P 500, NASDAQ, and, and Russell combined. So you can see the symbols here in the top right. The bigger these positions are, the more important the options expirations are. Uh, most of you know that the bigger options expirations happen on the third Friday of each month in the S&P 500. There are these little daily expirations. So you can see how small these ones are coming up. And then there's the monster expiration uh, coming up on the 15th. You'll also note that there's a massive imbalance here. As the market has rallied, call values have increased. And so we have a huge orange bar, huge call positions relative to put positions. That's an imbalance to me that suggests that we could be due for some uh, window of weakness or possibly short-term mean reversion after all these calls expire and associated hedging flows go away, right? In theory, there's a lot of hedging flows tied to these big call positions. And so if those call positions go away, then those hedging flows may unwind. I would also point you to this mid-January expiration. Now, the January expiration is not all that large for uh, the index flow. So again, NASDAQ and S&P, but it is massive for single stocks. I can show a chart of that uh, momentarily here, but uh, just know that January expiration is a, is a major event. Um, put that in the back of your mind, circle it on your calendars, your trading journals, whatever it may be, that January 19th period. Okay, so let's talk about the OPEX cycle uh, and the idea of how options flows help to move markets is important as we move into next week. Um, on expir options expiration, which is what we're uh, approaching right now, positions expire and any associated hedging flows would be covered. So I mentioned before, hey, the dealer's got to buy 5 million shares of AMC, and they're going to hold those shares until the contracts are sold or they expire. So in theory, if the dealers have 5 million shares tied to AMC calls and all of those calls expire, well, what do they got to do? They got to sell those shares of stock, right? So that's the idea of the imbalance of when you have a bunch of call positions that are expiring, uh, hedging flows have to unwind, right? So this position we're rent coming into now on the 15th, we're expecting a lot of hedging flows to be unwound. And then what happens starting really kind of the second or third week of December? Well, options positions start to rebuild, right? People buy new uh, call positions or put positions out for next December. They buy more short-term positions. And as we turn through the month, as we, as we move more towards January expiration, Options positions build more and more and more and more. Most people tend to focus on that third Friday expiration. That's where positions build up. And with that, options hedging positions build up and then options positions expire. And then we start the cycle again. So this is the third Friday of the month cycle. You can kind of set it to your watch and watch these positions build up. Now with the proliferation, proliferation excuse me, of zero DTE or short data options positions, there's many cycles, right? Tied to the Friday expirations with single stocks particularly single stocks that have a lot of uh, retail attention like an NVIDIA or Tesla or something. Um, so there's these mini cycles inside of the larger monthly cycle. But that's the general ebb and flow. So back to this chart, all of these positions are going to expire. New positions here in January, you'll see these January call and put positions will start to build up. And as we march towards those, that January expiration, those January positions will expire. Then people will turn to building positions up in February, so on and so on. It's a 30-day cycle. And this, this, you know, knowing where these positions are set to expire is also such a critical point in watching options flows. And, and why is that? Well, it's this idea that as these positions and hedging flows build up, they're controlling price action at an increasing rate into expiration. And then expiration, as I said before, then when these positions go, these hedging positions unwind. So in this case, we're trapped inside of this box here, right? And so if you know this box is really big and impactful, which is something we talk about on a daily basis, and you know that, hey, next week, round FOMC, 1213, and then into this huge options expiration, these flows should go away. That can help you time your trades or look for different behaviors, right? Because we argue that right now you shouldn't bet on a breakout. Today, we rejected at 4592. And if you're on our note, we said, look, the call wall has been sitting there. It hasn't moved. There's no reason to think the market's going to break out. There's also no reason to think that there's going to be a huge crash in the market because of these big positions that are blocking us in this box. But when would you break, bet on a breakout? Well, you bet on a breakout when these positions are set to change and, and that allows for larger moves uh, in the index flow. 
Now, as an example, not only do we think about support and resistance, but we also think about this idea of volatility. So let's say that we're all futures traders or we're trading spider shares of stock right now, and you're feeling good about the fact that you said, hey, you know, 4,600 was a call wall and I was fancy and I shorted the open today. I sold the, let's just say I sold the spiders at 450, sorry, 460, let's just say for sake of math, I sold the absolute high. Um, and I'm short the market. How long should I hold my short position for? Some people, and I've seen examples of this before, particularly on news events or something, say, oh, you know, the end is near. I'm holding this position for, you know, 2% uh, for your future trader. I'm holding this thing for 70 handles today because I think the end is near. Well, if you look at our volatility estimates, you would say to yourself, our volatility estimate, for example, today is only 65 basis points. So we only think that the max move on the market is 65 basis points or half a percent, a little over half a percent. And there's also this giant bar down here at 49, uh, excuse me, 45.50, which should be support. Then I have a very clear target if I shorted this, this upper band of where I should cover my trade. I also have a clear, clear target of where I may want to enter, right? As I get down into these levels that matter to me, like 455 SPY, for example, this morning. So knowing where the support and resistance lines is important. But if you think about that, what that you're doing really is trading in a way volatility, right? Because volatility is just in, in essence, an estimate of how much you think markets are set to move. If you're an options trader, volatility is a huge component into how much you buy or sell an options for. But if you're a futures or, or trading spiders, you're also trading volatility. How much do you think the market's going to move? Do you scalp today? Do you look for a huge swing? Do you hold for several days thinking this is a breakout? Or do you go, hey, look, I caught... 50 bips today, uh, half a percent. I'm good. You know, let's let's wait for another opportunity. Well, in this market, I I'd say, hey, uh, if you catch 60, 70 basis points today, you, you max your opportunity on a single trade, right? That that's the general idea. So that estimate of volatility is important. So each and every day in our founders note, we give this estimate of how much we think the market is going to move. But if you look at the x-axis. Some of you have heard this concept of positive and negative gamma. Well, one way to measure that is what we call our gamma index. And, and the idea here is that the more positive gamma gets, the higher number you see on this gamma index, that's associated with less movement in the market. So the x-axis here is our gamma index. And, and the larger we are, we're, um, let me actually read to you what the, the number is for today so you guys have an idea. So the gamma index today is 1.4. Okay, so the gamma index is 1.4. And if you look at that, that's let's just call it 1.5 for sake of argument. The y axis is how much volatility is in the market. So, how much, what percent wise on an absolute basis, how far did the market move? Well, you can see that at 1.5, the market tends to move on average. We have a 1% realized volatility. That's very, very small, right? If you move down, Right. If that gamma index gets more towards being negative, you can see that volatility sharply expands. Well, how does this gamma index slide up and down? It has to do with what the balance is between calls and puts. The more calls that we generally see in the market, the more positive this index is. And the more puts that we see in the market, the more negative this index is. So this index was very negative or down towards the bottom of this range back in 2023, particularly when we were in the lows of last year. Right. And with that, we had massive huge volatility in the market. Further, when options positions ex uh, expire, it changes the gamma index and changes the amount of volatility that we have. Because remember this idea of, hey, when these big positions go away, right, on expirations like this, when this expiration, all these calls clear out, our gamma index probably is going to drop from, let's say, 1.5 to 1. Well, what happens at 1? There's more volatility. So you can forecast this and plan your trades around it, right? If you're bearish, and you're frustrated, I would say, well, wait until next week, right? Because if we get a little bit of a bad FOMC uh, reading or a bad CPI reading and all these options positions expire, well, then you finally may get that breakdown that you've been waiting for. Or if you're long stocks and you're saying, hey, uh, you know, this is boring and you're selling calls against this position, I would say, hey, after OPEX, pull back on selling those calls because we thought may finally get a breakout if you're, if you're bullish. So that's where looking at these gamma levels on a key uh, on a daily basis really matters to you. That, that's the underlying information that matters. Now, when you go and you work with simpler trading to design your trades, or you say, "Hey, you know, uh, 
what's my roadmap here, right? Um, how am I mapping out these options flows to help me strike a trade? This information can help you there right now, whether you want to buy stocks against this, buy futures, sell butterflies, sell call spreads, buy puts, whatever it is you want to do, the way that you express this can vary a lot and can really matter to your PL. But knowing this information really gets your kind of compass uh, pointed in the right direction. Right? Okay, I know this is north. Now, do I drive north? Do I fly north? Do I walk north? Or do I need a boat? You know, <laughs> uh, let's talk about a single stock example. This one happened just recently. Um, in my previous life, I uh, was on a basket trading desk, which was a really interesting position because my clients were pension funds and uh, the pension funds all track the S&P 500. So every time a stock was added or moved to um, the S&P 500, it was a big event for us because we had to position ourselves to buy or sell Uber shares of stock to these indexers. And, you know, they have to sell a basket of other stocks so they could buy Uber in this case, uh, Uber being added to the S&P 500. So a lot of people front run this. Uh, you can see the move in the stock after earnings, you know, just really blasted to the 60 point level. And if you're on Twitter and if you're just thinking about this, you go, hey, great. Every pension fund who tracks the S&P 500 in the world has to buy Uber shares of stock. Isn't that awesome? Well, how do I trade this thing? Well, as you can see here, there's a really nasty candle there at 60. Uh, not, you know, maybe it's not the ugliest candle you've ever seen, but it's a, it's definitely a, a pretty nasty candle, especially when you look back in 2021 and see that was the market high. Well, how does options flows help you trade this is the question that hopefully you are all thinking at this moment. And I would say, well, let's look at some of this data. Um, on the bottom right is the gamma by strike just like this this gamma that i mentioned here for the s p 500 we do that for individual stocks so in this case what you can see is in orange is calls and in blue is puts on our member q a's that we do every monday and thursday we talk about a lot of single stocks like this and i just want you to focus on where these bars are uh because what this tells you is that there are calls at the 60 strike but if you look over 60 there's hardly any positions there right all the positions above there are at a fraction of what's happening at the 60 strike and then down to the 50 strike. Now, I, what I would say to you is, and 60 is our call wall, as you can see in the top left here for Uber, generally you consider that to be our resistance level. And so, you know, on one hand you say, okay, Brent, um, I, great, there's a lot of calls there, it could be a resistance. I'm not, so, I'm not so sure I believe on hedging flows, but I would ask you this, there are, I think 13,000 hedge funds in the world, pension funds, banks, all sorts of incredibly smart people out there, you know, not to mention us retail folks. If Uber going to the S&P 500 was extremely bullish um, and there was a ton of value set to be unlocked there, what do you expect there to be a huge number of calls being added at strikes above, right? We're not seeing that. So take it from a sentiment perspective on its face if you don't wanna kind of buy into these hedging flows, right? No one buying calls over 60 is really interesting. Now, the top left, and I'm sorry it's a little obscured by the bottom right chart, but bear with me. Uh, the top left is our hero indicator. What does hero indicator do? Hero indicator measures the real-time hedging uh, flows that are unlocked by options trade. So every time a op option trade takes place in real time, we measure what the hedging flows are associated with that. And what you'll note is that if the orange line is going up, that's telling us that people are buying calls. And so dealers and market makers have to buy shares of stocks. So what you can see is that right as the market opens at 930, the time is the x-axis, People rush in. I think this was right when the, the announcement was confirmed that uh, Uber is being added to the SP 500. And you see huge calls rush in and we break that call wall level, right? We trade up to about 61. And then what you can see is once we get over that call, call wall, that orange line turns south. What happens when this orange line turns south? That's telling us that all those traders who played the rush in right after the open started dumping their calls. And so you can see the orange line drops sharply. We're over the call wall. The white line is the stock. And as those calls start getting sold, the stock starts to mean revert. And you can see that over the course of the day, calls continued to get sold, right, to the tune of about a million dollars uh, over, the, over, the, uh, over the morning. And with that, the stock also faded rather sharply. Now, most of that call trading was done in two spurts. You can see here, huge call buying up to about $40 million worth of what we call positive Delta or $40 million worth of calls being bought. And then immediately in the span of about half an hour, you could see that this right Y axis, which is dollars went from 40 million down to about 10. So that tells us about $30 million worth of calls were dumped right after that. Now, again, um, 
if if this was a huge event and you say, okay, there's a lot of short term noise here. I think this is tradable noise. We can talk about that after. Uh, but just from a longer term perspective, you know, why weren't people buying more calls above the call wall? Right. The the lineup of huge calls at that level and calls getting dumped as soon as you break that level is a significant not only from a sentiment perspective, but also a flow perspective. And if you look up a chart of Uber, it's been unable to kind of break this level. This was this chart was taken on Monday. You know, I can show you examples of this that occur uh, every single day. Now, some of you go, hey, how do I know when these flows are important? You know, how do I know? Because not options don't control all stocks every single day. How do I know when it matters? We have this little thing called a flow indicator. It's this little yellow dot. And when the flow indicator goes off, it's telling you that the options flows, the real-time flows are significant to the stock uh, and you should pay attention. So if you're an Uber trader and you see that flow alert goes off, you know that options are a big driver of stock action and you can trade accordingly. So that's a rough example of Uber. I know uh, Henry has shown a bunch of examples, as does uh, John. I I don't want to get too far into the weeds here. One of the tools that we're launching uh, in about two weeks is what we call a volatility dashboard. Um, If you're not familiar with SKU, which is what we're looking at here in this purple line, uh, we'll explain what SKU is in uh, the boot camps that we're doing. But the implied vol dashboard that we're launching uh, to members of Spot Gamma uh, in two weeks time, we're launching this uh, actually 12 days. um, It gives you a lot of other insights. So what is this giving you? What you can see is the X axis, and I apologize, it's a little tough to read. This is the 60 strike right here. And so what you can see, this is the skew of short dated options. So what is the implied volatility or what are the values of calls and puts that are tied to 12 8 expiration? That's Friday's expiration. You can see here that the line is going sharply higher, right? And not only is the line going sharply higher, it's higher than this purple, I call it cone. The purple cone is the historic uh, percentile, 10th to 9th percentile of this of the purple line over the last 30 days. So the fact that this purple line is now well above this gradient is telling us that calls are now at a higher price than they've been at any point in the last 30 days um, for Uber. This is telling you that there's massive call demand, uh, that this massive call demand has really jacked up call prices. And so what this is telling you is that if you are a call seller and you are looking to sell calls and you combine this information with this information, you're knowing you know you're selling calls at a very high value. Because sometimes you could you could hit a situation like this and calls are not actually that attractively priced. But if you look at this situation, you know that calls are trading at a relatively rich price. Uh, so this can help you to design trades is, is what the takeaway here. Uh, it also tells you that a lot of these positions are indeed long calls as people have been playing this move. Um, and so there's a lot of hedging flows that could be unlocked because of this. Uh, Again, I don't want to get too into the weeds in this. I just want to give you a quick preview of some of the things that are coming, some extra information, some extra tidbits that you can maybe glean uh, from a result of this uh, volatility information. I wanted to leave, uh, before I turn to some of your questions, on an example of how implied volatility moves price. Um, Some of you have heard of this term VANA before, and we have some metrics that measure VANA and how, say, when the VIX moves, that impacts the uh, hedging flows of the S&P 500 or of single stocks, right? Because implied volatility is a factor of how you price Uber calls, for example. So how does implied volatility or volatility move the price of options and the impact of hedging flows on options? I want to give you a rough example. So hopefully you can tie together, let's say the movement of VIX or changes in implied volatility and how that can impact the stock. So right now we have a very low VIX in the S&P 500, right? Uh, in, in very low volatility. The market's really done nothing over the last couple of weeks. So let's say that implied volatility for a one month, two and a half percent out of the money put in the S&P, let's say the implied volatility of that is a 10. So this is pricing in you know 30 days from now, a put that's roughly, let's say uh, 45, uh, excuse me, 44 strike put, 4,400 strike put, excuse me. The price of that option, if we price it right now, is about 17 bucks and it has a delta of 22. So um, let's use the example of spiders. Uh, we could substitute spider for SPX. They track each other very close. So a 440 put in the S&P. Uh, if I was to buy one of those, the market maker would be short one of those puts. They'd have to sell 22 shares of spiders to hedge themselves. Great. If nothing else happens in the market, S&P doesn't move, but suddenly people get worried about rate hikes or whatever else it miss- might be, and a bunch of other people start buying puts. The implied volatility of that same put, if it goes to 25, 
remember, nothing else changed, just the value of the implied volatility input goes from 10 to 25. Suddenly the put price spikes significantly, right? So instead of it being, let's say, $1.70, because we're going to talk about spiders, it goes to $8.50. So the price of that put goes up significantly. But look at what the delta change is. It goes from 22 to 37. Dealers have to sell another 15 shares of stock in this case to hedge themselves. Well, if this is what's happening across all of the puts in the S&P 500, you can imagine that those hedging flows go from a small amount or a, a decent amount of, of shares of stock or futures that have to get sold. And it essentially doubles the number of shares of, or futures that has to get sold, right? The This is the impact of, let's say, the VIX spiking from 15 to 20 or 30, right? That is the Vanna, if you've, heard, if you've heard this term, Vanna, right? Vanna as a driver of flows. This is why it matters. This is why it matters if you're trading the crypto stocks right now where Coinbase, Mara, all these names have huge implied volatility, right? Well, if the stock stops going up, that volatility craters, look at the change in underlying shares of stock that would have to be uh, adjusted as a result, just that volatility changing, right? So this is why volatility matters to you, volatility forecasting. This is why this dashboard that looks at S&P 500 volatility or single stock volatility, whatever it may be, uh, this is why that those types of flows really matter for you because we are translating or trying to get a foothold on, number one, not only what sentiment is, right? How much these volatility metrics are changing, which tells you supply and demand and options, but also trying to show you how uh, these underlying hedging flows may matter as well. So um, this is a lot to digest. I, I fully uh, appreciate that. My goal here was to help to explain to you guys, to give you the, the underlying behavior of why options drive stock flows, why these different metrics that we're showing on our screen here matter to you on a daily basis, whether you're trading futures, stocks, options, whatever it is, uh, why you need to pay attention. Because remember, these options flows are actually increasing, right? We're now added zero DTE options in gold, GLD, ETF, TLTs. You know they want to add it in single stocks because it's a huge revenue driver for exchanges, right? Um, and and revenue, you know, drives everything. So the more offerings we get for single stock trades, uh, short dated options expirations, the more these volumes are going to increase, and the more of a driver they are uh, to underlying flows. And also understanding this at critical junctures in the market, you know, it's, it's been quite frankly a little tough to write our notes over the last let's say week because very little is taking place. Right. And I think that particularly if you've joined Spot Gamma recently, uh, you go, well, Brent's notes have been pretty boring. Well, the market is pretty boring, but but there's something in that being boring that, you know, hey, instead of wasting my time trading today, uh, the S&P 500, I'll go trade something that's a little more exciting or that has a little more volatility. There's always something interesting to trade. Right? Um, but a couple of times a year, you know, like when Uber is making this all time high uh, or the S&P is at extreme lows like it was in October. And we were saying, look, no one else is buying puts down here at 4,000. Um, there are these significant times where you really want to sit up and pay attention. And so, you know, this is the time when the market is quiet that you want to get a good grasp on options, hedging flows and start to track, hey, what happens around this big expiration in FOMC next week? You know, does this move the market? Oh, look, this is a prime example of how it moves the market. Look at January options expiration. Let me, I'll show you all a chart of that. Um, I did a little presentation with a friend of mine, uh, Imran. And uh, so, you know, there's some more advanced concepts. Remember I talked about how big the January options expiration was? Um, well, look at this chart here. This is the single stock. So you remember this chart I showed you with uh, this, these orange bars that shows you index, the size of index flows uh, set to expire on the 15th. Well, if you look at single stock flows set to expire, this is December expiration. It's pretty big, but look at January. It's massive, right? And if you look at January of 2022, the value of these calls is driven by the stock market going up. We all know that when the stock market goes up, calls gain in value. Well, if you remember 2021, the market did this 45 degree angle rip into 2022. I think January 1st of 2022 or the first day of trading in January 2002, I think was the all time high. And then what happened? The market absolutely cratered and it bottomed. This first short term bottom was at the start of January options expiration. You can mark it the Monday after was the low. Um, this is a very similar looking situation, maybe not the same magnitude, but if you look at where we rallied from, right? Almost the same spot as January, 2022. 
excuse me, January of 2021, if I drew a line across this, right? And look at where we're closing. Where we're not, I mean, yes, we're two, three, four percent off that 4,800 high. But if you look at single stocks like NVIDIA, Microsoft, Apple, the leaders, those are all at all-time highs right now, right? So the the overall market move is very similar. There's a lot of overlap to this. And so when you look at all of these calls set to expire, remember what I said before, if 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 you have 5 million shares of AMC and those calls are set to expire, say on January 19th, what happens? You sell all those shares of stock. Well, if people start to get scared about the movement of price action in the start of January and they start selling their calls early, dealers got to start unloading stock. And it's a, it's a feedback loop that can really help drive markets lower. Incidentally, the VIX high was the Monday after January expiration in uh, 2022. That's despite the fact that the market crashed lower and we had the onset of the Ukraine war. Neither of those could drive an intraday move that was higher. I think the VIX hit 38 um, on that move down. So that that's the that that is the movement that is driven by these uh, that by these options flows. Uh, that can be really rather significant. All right. Uh, that was a mouthful. I know we've been going for uh, a good 40 minutes here. I don't want to drown you all in options terminology. Um, so uh, let's check out some of the questions. Um, Hannah, I want to get to yours first. Can I please explain key gamma strike, key delta strike, and hedge wall? Uh, absolutely. So let's bring up the spot gamma dashboard here, and we can look at a couple of names. I like getting put on the spots. So if you've got something interesting, uh, I'm happy to check that out. Um, so we have this concept of key gamma strike. I actually highlighted Google this morning in our founder's note. Um, so let's check, take a look at how Google is trading. We're looking at the hero in real time. Uh, now I mentioned specifically 130, uh, which is the key gamma strike and the hedge wall in this case in Google. I said 130 has been a major level, um, here in Google. And I think one that should be a support line. And so what you can see here is that the purple line is hero and kind of similar to where the market has behaved overall. Uh, the early morning highs were sold and that purple line going down is telling us that people are either selling calls or buying puts and with that the stock goes down you can see that uh right above 130 ish there was a bounce that corresponded to the options flows but we're really ultimately back towards testing 130. now what i think is interesting about the options flows is that they initially bought the lows of the market uh and it's a fairly light amount of flow as you can see this purple line going up um it's threatening to roll over here a little bit, but really what the summary of this is, is that uh, the flows that have unlocked or turned on since we've really moved into the lows of 12 o'clock have been pretty tepid, right? It's been about, you see in the y-axis, uh, right y-axis, about $5 million to $10 million worth of order flow in Google. And your question is probably, is that a lot? Well, if you see this gauge, the full width of the gauge is the hero value low and high for the last 30 days. And the white dot is today's reading. So it's pretty negative order flow in Google overall but this is a major support level right the hedge wall and the key gamma strike i'll explain them in a second and so if people aren't buying puts in google here uh at the lows then then i feel good about it being a support line right if if this purple line continues to go down then then that tells me that the risk of this hedge wall or key gamma strike being support uh diminishes right because because people are buying puts or selling calls and so that's a this is a key moment to watch in google now if we go over to the equity hub and we look at a couple of key things. Um, you can see our labels here, right? Key gamma strike is at 130. The key gamma strike is the strike which has the most amount of gamma. So the amount of blue call, uh, blue puts and orange calls, if we sum that up, that's basically our hedge wall. It's the level that hatch the most gamma, which tells us that there should be the largest amount of uh, hedging flows tied to that strike. And then the the uh, hedge wall is a separate proprietary measure of where we think a big support and resistance line is driven by options flows. Those two strikes don't always line up to be the same. The hedge wall and the key game strike are not always the same level. And we can track the way these positions move over time. So you can see this gamma strike has been at 130 over the last several days, despite the stock actually going below it. This is the key. This is the stock price. So even though we've tested this level, this level has not moved, um, which I think is an indication of support. Same thing with the hedge wall. It's stuck at 130. The other thing I would note is that the these big options positions, the biggest options positions are not set to change until the 19th of January, that big January expiration I mentioned. So 
I feel comfortable leaning on 130 as a, as a major level um, for the next several weeks because of the fact that most of the options flow doesn't set to expire until the 19th of January. Um, it's not the same as, as it is, you know, the other stocks have 12, eight expiration is a big one. Like Nvidia, if we look up Nvidia and you can see, uh, here we're at 466. Most of the gambling now expires on 12, eight. It's a lot more active options order flow, uh, with 460 should function as short-term support. And I think we're kind of right on that level at the moment, uh, as you can see here. Um, another question from Hannah from before is the skew chart. Uh, SKU is showing us the price of out of the money calls versus out of the money puts. So, um, D stands for Delta. So a 90 Delta, uh, is essentially looking at a put that's 10 Delta out of the money. So, uh, 90 minus hundred is 10. So that's a 10 Delta put. This is a 25 Delta put. So essentially this is the at the money where it says 50. So what, are, what are calls price relative to puts? Um, there's not a lot of skew here. There's not a lot of shift in, in NVIDIA. It's very flat. But if we were to look at something like, uh, I think, GameStop, which reports, um, you'll see how tilted this metric is, right? So what this is telling us that traders are pricing calls with a lot higher value relative to puts, the fact that this line slopes up. So that generally is a signal that things are too bullish in the name, or that people are uh, bidding up the price of options a little bit too much. Now, a lot of these metrics are going to change when we launch our vol dashboard, uh, but that's really what the takeaway is. You can see here that calls are very richly valued relative to puts. That's generally unusual, generally a sign that the bullish stuff is overdone. Um, so we call this skew. In this case, the blue line is uh, Friday skew. So it's the skew for options that expire Friday. Um, excuse me, the uh, green line is the options that expire Friday. And then the blue line is the options that expire 30 days out of time. So you can compare those and see how they move and glean a little bit of extra information from that. Um, K2 says, well, we guys have call walls and put walls and other gamma levels uh, flowing as a data stream in your indicator for toss. Um, yes. So we do want to push at least for, let's say the top 50 stocks. Um, I, I can't let that copy payload get too big but we do want to add in trading view and toss individual levels so specifically you can use thinkorswim or trading view to track all of our key levels um if you have questions on anything in spot game if you hit this little eye you get a pop-up box with explanations on everything right there's videos glossaries all that kind of stuff so you just want a quick explanation uh use those little eyes and then we have uh two q a's a week at one o'clock eastern time with myself um is the boot camp for sg members sg it's for simpler trading members um you can sign up if you're a spot gamma member for sure um and we're going to cover a lot of different information on options markets and uh the way that um spot gamma helps you to measure trading tools it's not going to be a spot gamma sales pitch in the boot camp it's going to show you uh, it's we're going to educate how options flows impact markets but we're going to show you spot game of tools to do that because, you know, essentially everything that I built in the platform, I needed to, or I need, I should say, to help me analyze the options market. And that's why everything in here exists. There's some stuff that people go, I don't really care about that, but but Brent cares about it as he's analyzing the market. For those of you who are a little unsure what I mean there, I write a daily founder's note. This comes out every single day. I've written every single one since January of 2020. Uh, we joke around, my wife and I, that I actually wrote a note from the birthing center for my second daughter uh she did not like that idea uh very much but you know um <laughs> duty calls i guess uh christian hello to you what is the 10 minute volume of calls and puts uh which has to be considered significant so the way that we measure this if you look at the hero indicator um i care about how much hedging flow is needed to move a six uh, a stock so interestingly we just got a hero flow alert oh look at that pop so what happened at 1.30, just after I was talking here, somebody came in and started buying a lot of calls or puts. Now, how do I know it's calls and puts? I can actually break it down. I don't want to overwhelm people. But basically what happened at 1.30, uh, I don't know, maybe JC is listening to me on this call. I just bought a, a, a bunch of Google calls. But this is orange line going up. I means somebody just unloaded on buying calls. It's about $10 million worth of calls. That's You can see because this indicator goes from eight to $8 million to $19 million. And our flow alert goes off. So what that's telling you is over the interval of time that we've been watching, it's a short-term interval 
enough calls have been bought that we think it should move the stock. That's what the flow alert is telling you. The flow alert measurement is slightly different for every single stock. It has something to do with what we call transaction cost analysis. Uh, it's a proprietary metric measurement. Again, it's unique to each stock. Um, it's a whole presentation in and of itself if we wanted to share it, which we're not terribly keen on sharing the underlying logic. Uh, a lot of our stuff gets copied. You know, loosely, loose lips sinks ships. <laughs> But just know that that is what the underlying driver is, Christian. I uh, hope that helps. Um, most recent data on the chart is the y-axis. Is there a way to move it? Uh, you can't move the axis. Uh, you can drag them up and down. Someone asked about here uh, uh, historical data. Excuse me. You can actually go back in time here uh, on the hero chart. We're coming out with an API, and we do have some historical data we've collected. Uh, we have to work on some legalities around uh, making that data available. Uh, exchanges are very protective of historical data. Um, our stats tell us that 70% of the time when the flow alert goes off, the stock mean reverts. Um, there's some caveats to that. We did a whole presentation. If you're interested in the presentation, let me know. But basically, when this flow alert goes off, as it did here, uh, when that volume tops out, in other words, if this orange line stalls, then, then we would expect the stock to mean revert and, and turn back down. Uh, that's what the stats are if you look at the presentation. Jack asked how to zoom it tighter. I, uh, that was from way before. I'm not sure what you're asking about, but I, I drag the x-axis is how I like to move this chart around. Uh, Tariq asked, do market makers close their hedges after expiration or on the day of expiration? Um, so you can't completely close out hedges because you don't know how many shares of stock will be in the money, right? And be assigned. Um, if you hold a call option that expires in the money, you are assigned shares of stock. So you really don't know. And that assignment all takes place on Saturday. You don't know and you can't make a full adjustment until the Monday really after, right? Um, so, uh, you know, Tariq, it's really a function of, we generally say, hey, the window of movement is, you know, largely opens up kind of the, in this case, Wednesday FOMC really until Monday, Tuesday, you know, it's that general week roughly of where these option flows are really material and, and have the chance to move markets. My view here is that volatility is very low uh, and we're due for a breakout. I, I think we break down is my guess um, into the start of the year. Generally, it's a pretty bullish period, I think, from now until uh, the last Friday of December. Uh, there's a lot of positions at 4,500 in the S&P, so we could drift maybe down to that level. But a lot of it is, I think, going to be dependent on what comes out of CPI and FOMC. Uh, there's a lot going on, on the macro side. Um, maybe this is a situation where you just buy a straddle for January and see what happens. I don't know. Um Beat Navy, uh, I'm glad that I my stuff has been helpful. <laughs> uh, can we just uh, DSI says, can one just use the hero indicator along with usual ST strategies like squeeze and hit indicators, or do you have to watch the US dollar and treasury yield? Yeah, I, I would just watch options flows, right? Um, as an expression of what's happening in the market, because oftentimes people go, hey, the, the treasury auction is matters, right? And I don't know if that's true, but if people start buying the, excuse my French, but crap out of calls around treasury auction, okay, I know why people are buying calls because of treasury auctions. Um, when do they stop with the call trading, et cetera, right? That, that, that someone once said in a, in a podcast, you know, she is, a, I think her name is Amy Wu. Uh, I think she works at RBC. If I'm wrong on that, she'll probably never hear me make this comment, but she said something along the lines of, you know, people, people essentially, you know, will give you their opinion constantly, but opinions are, are cheap, right? When you buy a call or sell your call or buy or put or sell your put, that's you putting your money where your mouth is. That's conviction. Um, and so that's, you know, another reason I think the hero flows are, are meaningful. Um, David says one day last week in UNH, you saw the put wall bump up above its call wall. It is unusual in names that don't have a lot of options flows and have very chunky positions. You can see our levels. You know, so so what David's saying is, you know, if you look at uh, you know these levels like right, GameStop, uh, the call wall is at twenty, the put wall is down at ten. Generally, that's how things lay out. 
sometimes the levels will flicker and move. There's really big movement in stock and the stock is it's like if an earnings move, right? And you have the stock gap up 20% or down 20% and then people start to rebuild calls at a lower strike. Those are the situations where you can see those, those levels invert, right? Call wall below put wall. Um, so it's not, I don't think I've ever seen it happen in the SPX index, but it happens uh, occasionally in the NASDAQ and then it can happen a lot in, in especially thinner single stocks, but, but names that have had big earnings moves. Um, Michael Swain, hello to you. You say, can we expect more volatility? I don't, well, you got CPI coming up next week and then, you know, this FOMC. So I actually think we were looking at SKU in the same chart with Imran before. And, and the observation was that uh, term structure. So this is January term structure, this gray line, the shaded gray area is the 90th and 10th percentile. And you can see that current roughly 45 days. So Jan SKU is lower across the board than it's been at any point in the last 30 days. Term structure also very flat out in time. So gray is term structure from a month ago. Teal is today. This is very, very flat. Um, so the kind of just like gun to head expression of this is like, you want to get long volatility. Long volatility is owning long options. If you buy a put or a call, then you're taking a delta expression, right? I think the market's going to go up or down. Uh, you can buy... Uh, a straddle would be, you know, the most obvious expression of getting long volatility because, um, you know, your long straddle could be the market goes up or down. Right um, now, someone else said maybe VIX futures or something like that. But if the market rise, VIX tends to kind of go down. Right. Because there's a little bit of skew in the VIX. <clears throat> uh, that's a story for another day. But yeah, Michael, um, the, the problem also with the iron condor sales is vols cheap. Right. Market's pricing in if the if implied vol for next week is a 12 and we got FOMC and CPI, maybe you just buy some options because you go, hey, if anything, we're priced for perfection right now. So if anything makes us move more than the market is anticipating, the market's anticipating, anticipating nothing. So if we get something in terms of movement, then maybe your options pay out. Um, question on the red retail line in Hero. How do you determine this? Uh, it is based on the... So Matt's talking about Hero specifically. We have a retail indicator. Um, the retail indicator is based on where the trades are taking place, the aux the execution mechanism, not the size of the trade. Uh, the retail guys look wrong today, I guess, is what that is showing us today. Um, David Red asked about spot gamma working with Trade Station 10. I don't know if it works with Trade Station 10, to be honest with you. Uh, if you have a sample format and you send it to us, info at spotgamma.com, we could build up a, a sample format. Um, Pacha Papa, there are some simpler trading deals. If you go on tomorrow night, uh, we have a webinar. I think uh, Mizra very kindly put the link in there so you have that information. Um, same thing, DSI. Check out the webinar tomorrow. We'll be talking about that. Uh, when the hedge wall rises up, Esther, um, so our our takeaway is that when you see levels go up, that is bullish. When you see levels go down, that is bearish. So, you know, here, this 20 level in GameStop we're looking at, you know, is, a, is the call wall. Earnings are today. So, you know, it's not the best example, but we were looking at Uber before. And um, call wall not moving, right? Not a great indication. Uh, key gamma strike not moving. Key delta strike. Hedge, none of these levels are moving. Even the stock is getting added to the S and P 500, and the stock's at 60. That's you. You know, you don't want to necessarily that's bearish because uh, the levels aren't going down. But you know, if you're long this thing and hoping for more, I don't love it. Uh, I want to see like call wall go to 62, hedge wall go to 45, right? Levels rolling up to me tells me that options are being positioned at higher strikes. Generally tells me that um, that's bullish indication. Um, the hedge wall, I think, is relevant through options period, you know, throughout options periods. Uh, Tom is the question. Uh, Bob N says, you see that SPX is currently on the vol trigger. Uh, I believe our friend, uh, Mr. Voodoo mentioned something about this before. So let's take a look at S and P action today. So we can go to the index page here and, uh, just 
look at the way things are trading. So we have this concept of the vol trigger and the vol trigger is our risk metric, um, which basically says that, hey, if you are long the market right now, as long as we're above the vol trigger, stay long the market as a generalization. So I often talk about 401ks, right? A lot of us don't like to day trade our 401k, but you know, look, um, sometimes you work, you don't, you don't want to own stocks during a crash, right? So when may we crash? Well, under the vol trigger is kind of when we have risk on, uh, excuse me, risk off market. Um, and then the, the top, the top indicator is our call wall. So the idea here is if I zoom in on this chart, um, here is our call wall, the purple line, the vol trigger is the yellow line. And so, you know, when we're between those two own stocks and if we get over the over the call wall, we're over we're overbought. Right. So do you want to sell calls against that? Maybe um, that's the general idea. But if we're over the call wall, it's not really a reason to sell your stocks. If we break the vol trigger, you go, OK, uh, then risk is on. Now, in this situation, it gets a little tricky because of all of these big positions, right? This huge gamma bar at 4,500, as we've been saying in our notes, I think is support. And so if you're talking about, hey, I'm, I'm going to sell my 401k holdings or, or hedge my 401k holdings, I'm not going to do that on a day trading basis, but I'm worried about over the next month. If we test 4,500, you can see the positions start to really dwindle under 4,500. So that's, that's our major risk off. So it's another percent from here. We'd expect to find big support going into next week. But then after next week, we break 4,500, that could be a real move. Now, how does that relate to the vol trigger? Well, the vol trigger is reflecting, you know, a lot of positions being added, particularly short-term options being added in and filled in that are tied to next week's expiration, tied to some of these risk events, et cetera. So I think it's an intraday support and resistance level now. Uh, the vol trigger is sort of synonymous with hedge wall. Um, and you can see the market, you know, reacting to it to the upside here. We're rejecting that level um, a couple of times today. Um, so on an intraday basis in a market environment like this, I don't assign a ton of, uh, longer term credence to it, right? Because of the fact that I know positions are going to be changing so much, uh, over the next couple of days and weeks. Um, and if we're to break 4,500 or move down to 4,500, um, you know, break a 4,500, I consider significant for a longer term view, regardless of when big positions are set to expire or not. Um, you know, today 4,500 is the obvious, I think huge support level. It turns out we actually bounced at this level 4,561. What's funny is if you look at that, that's SPY 455 or should be right on SPY 455. Um, and if we look at the big options positions here, spiders can often at times have even bigger positions, the S and P, and you can see how big. So if you add those two numbers up in the legend there, four and $24 million of put gamma and $382 million of call gamma. It's huge. All of these levels in spiders are massive. And we're just gummed up in that range. Um, so that that's basically the way we're looking at it here. Uh, and all the morning notes, we buy the dip, sell the rip. Like that's what I'm meaning by this, right? Like buy that area that we bounced every time over the last five days, sell the area we've rejected from over the last five days, play the tight range. Um, that's the idea. Uh, so Mark asked about the subscription. Do we teach how the system works? We, we have, you know, a huge archive of training videos. We have the monthly, you know, the Q and A is twice a week. Uh, we have a spot gamma course you can take on all that sort of stuff. So there's not a live course, but there's enough material and resources. You can join our Discord chat uh, where, you know, hopefully you get, we like to say you get an embedded options education when you join spot gamma. I do write my notes at what I call a, is an institutional caliber level uh, because my hope is that I can kind of like give you guys the decoder ring to understand the options flows. You don't need a PhD in math. There's language that I use here like anything else. You know, it's unique to you. If you're a technical trader and you're like, yeah, I rejected the FIB. I, you know, what the heck is a FIB? I don't know what that means. Fibonacci. Oh, Fibonacci. Okay, well, what does that mean? You know, it's this technical blah, blah, blah. So it's the same thing. Vanna charm, et cetera. What does that mean? Uh, it's not that you need, you know, to know thermodynamics, to price options, to understand why hedging flows matter. So 
uh, again, you know, the boot camp uh, I think will be tremendously helpful. Um, look, the, the there's a free seven day trial that you can take, uh, but it can be a little bit overwhelming if you're new to some of this stuff. We're going to go over it tomorrow with a special deal, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't want to take anybody's money and they're like, I'm lost and I hate this. Right. So we've tried to do a lot of stuff to help train people, educate them uh, and make sure you feel like you're getting value. Uh, the Barney on the bubbles and labels. Some people say they have problems seeing bubbles, and labels and think or swim. Others don't. I think generally the labels get the way that you have your chart set up. Are you looking at a day chart, extended hours? There's something fishy with that. On my chart looks fine. And then, uh, we have somebody named blue in discord who's a great member of our team. Um, and so if you happen to be in the spot game discord, you can ping him on the bubbles. He, it's something to do with adjusting the date and time. Um, when the flow dots on the chart, uh, they're indicating flow already occurred and that's the peak of the flow. No. So Darren, great question. The flow alert is telling us that significant flow has turned on right for a stock. Uh, but there's nothing that tells us or nothing that says that, Hey, um, that flow can't, it has to stop. Right. Cause if I could predict when flow would stop, wow, that would be, <laughs> but I don't know, like, Hey, if some guy's sitting at, uh, Bill Ackman's hedge funds buying the crap out of bank of America calls this morning, how do I know when he's done? Uh, this is kind of, you know, the admitted art to this a little bit. You can see actually we breached the call wall here in, in bank of America by a pretty good amount. And then what happens? People dump calls and back we go to Bank of America. So, you know, Flow Alert tells me, hey, material flow in Bank of America, and I need to assess when this flow is going to shut off. I think there was some news this morning that maybe made the second leg higher happen or a treasury auction or who the heck knows. Uh, but, you know, when does this flow shut off? There's a art to determining that a little bit. We're working on maybe some moving averages or something, but you know, look, the, the bottom line is that is part of the art of this, right? Is assessing when these flows stop. A lot of times the flows will stop uh, at major levels or just over them. So you can lean on those levels a little bit oftentimes to help assess that. Uh, but if you were just to sell a call spread here and above the call wall, you know, well, in this case, that would have worked out. Um, you know, I admittedly probably would have tried to short here, right, at 3140. Uh, based on this flow stopping. And then there was like another round. So I don't know if there was news here or something, but uh, this is, look, this is the, this is the marriage of a lot of what simpler trading does is, you know, how do you trade this stuff? Like, how do I add this extra element? I, I tend to trade options and I'll scout futures here and there. Uh, but other ways that help you express trades, right? Or you have a specific way you like to watch markets and hopefully you can overlay this data and information on that. Um, Barney, the, we do measure puts and calls in the flow alert. There's a little gooey bug with that. Uh, he's talking specifically about if we split this into put and calls, you only see the alert show up on the call line. We just arbitrarily made it on the call line because we can't print two flow alerts on one chart. Uh, it's a weird bug. And I don't really understand the software, but not, it, it's, a, it's a limitation of the software we're using, um, the charting framework. Uh, Mizra, thank you again for posting the boot camp there. Um, Darren, so the other thing that matters is how the, how the levels move. So, you know, outside of using mess support and resistance, I think it's a huge sentiment indicator measuring how and why, you know, these levels are moving up or down. Um, it, it really matters in my view. And again, it's not for every stock. We have ways of telling you what, it, when it matters. I don't want to get too much in the weeds. We're already over an hour. The dark color of this helps us inform us whether positions matter for a stock or not. Not all options flows matter in all stocks. So we have ways of telling you that too. Um, Greg, I tend to have, yes, if you can use trades for longer term trades, I tend to have a 30 day view in positions. Um, I think that there are significant, huge moves, you know, in certain stocks that can, you know, be matter to longer term holders like that Uber 60, I think could matter or S&P crashing into a huge options expiration. It could be a low for a few months. Uh, but admittedly, the flows tend to be more towards people who have shorter time frames. you know, intraday to maybe out to a month. Uh, but after a month, I don't really have any strong opinions on anything. 
Uh, there is a tutorial on how to get the uh, data into Thinkorswim. If you go to the integrations page here, Thinkorswim, and you can uh, watch the video, and that should help you there. Um, yeah, Matt W. So the floater is not a turn signal. That's right. It's a significant volume alert. You, the turn comes when the flow stops. And so flow is telling you, hey, options flow matters. Pay attention. And when you assess that that call flow or put flow is shut off, play mean reversion. That's the that's the level one way to play it. You can get into like some, you know, black belt judo analysis of some stuff that we've done before. Uh, of some other takeaways you can get from the flow, but I don't want to overwhelm everybody here. Um, Chaz asks how zero DT split from all their zero DTE. So in Hero, if you go to next expiration, that is zero DTE flow only. So teal line is what the zero DTE people are doing versus all flow. So today we've had a little bit more negative delta flow, negative delta meaning put buying or call selling from longer term traders. The teal line is very neutral over the day. You can see it's really unchanged from this morning, but there's some longer term put buyers uh, and or call sellers coming in the market here. Um, and so, you know, we get into the weeds with people on whether you watch zero DT today or you don't, does it matter or not? You know, there's a whole bunch of analysis that could take hours on this. Uh, you, you don't need hours of education to pick it up, but we could talk for hours on it, right? Um, I, I still stick car with, I just keep it at one day or, or infinite or one day, kind of the same thing. And then I just drag the window. This is how I like to do it. Um, trifold, when you add symbols to watch list, you don't see the chart in the right panel. Uh, I think you just need to click off and then maybe go back. If you still have a problem with that, after you hit save, let us know. And that's a tech issue, can you? Uh, where do you find a how do you spot game, how to set it up? If you go to this little eye indicator here, then you get all the videos hopefully you could desire. Uh, there's also, there used to be, so we moved it. Um, it's down here now. Well, if you go to resources, I know you can get it. There's knowledge base, there's a syllabus, uh, info at spotgamma.com with any questions. We also are happy to ask your questions. We also have the Q and A's Mondays and Thursdays at one. Uh, I've been joining the gold room, You know. John and Henry uh, Voodoo, a lot of uh, simpler trading folks have been using Spot Gamma. I'm extremely grateful for that. I know they're all picking up as well, and I, and hopefully you're able to um, see how they use it to gain some edge. Um, Barney, I look at all flow. Uh, all flow matters. If you're just watching zero DT, not much is happening, but there's huge longer data flows coming in the market. Uh, and longer data could be next week's calls too, right? Or puts. So, you know, those all matter. Uh, what I tend to see, if there's a lot of zero DTE or next expiration flow, i.e. the teal line and the purple line are married to each other, that tells me that's a lot of short dated flow. I'm much happier fading those moves, zero DT driven moves than longer dated flow. Because zero DT flow, you know, is, it's, gone, it's here today, gone tomorrow, right? And, and that's what I like to fade. All right, uh, my voice is starting to wane. I didn't bring any water up here. Don't know why. Um, Lorna, thank you for letting us know that um, this recording will get posted. Papillion, I didn't. I, I said that in a very American accent. I feel like. <laughs> uh, Papillon, maybe is I supposed to say it? Uh, sound a little better there. Um, Misera. Mirza, I keep saying Mizra. I'm so sorry. Mirza, pardon me for that. Uh, I hope that was just a handle and not your name. I didn't insult you that badly. Uh, people have hacked my last name a million times, though, so I, I feel your pain. Uh, Mirza has been uh, nice enough to add uh, the, the webinar for tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow night, please catch that. John will be opening that one up, and I'll give you a little bit more. Um, Papillon, there we go. <clears throat> uh, so John will give you some background on on what he sees out of the spot game of data. I'll give another uh, overview of what I'm seeing, and then I believe we'll have Henry come on as well with a few trade examples. That's where you'll have a special offer, not only for spot game of data, uh, but also for um, the boot camp that is coming up. Um, so uh, yeah. There will be uh, some great offers side of that. All right. 
I'm going to leave it there. Now I'm just making a bunch of noise with my mouth and not helping anybody. <laughs> um, do you want to look over? Mitch says he wants to review an old founder's note. Um, you know what? I can print this. Can I upload a file into the old counter here? No, it only lets me upload an image. Um, I don't know if I can upload a PDF. It doesn't, it says that I can't. So, uh, two things to note here. Number one, um, all the founders notes of all time are loaded up. Um, at least I think we've loaded them from the old, you know? Yeah. So you can go back and see what I thought. Uh, there's a lot of excellent thoughts in here. There's a couple of bad ones, uh, but we're an open book. So every single founder's note is in there. We write a note in the morning and a, route, and a note at night. Um, so uh, Trifle, if you could pop in a Discord or send us an email, info at spotgammon.com, we'll check out what's going on. If you want to take like a little loom or a little screen recording of what's happening, that would also be helpful. Uh, it should just work. Uh, I don't know if you have multiple browsers. You could try different browsers. Sometimes there's weird stuff where only Chrome works. I use Firefox and I'm okay. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, Mitch, I know you asked for a Founders Note sample. Info, Email us, info at spotgamma.com. Um, Yeah, you're using Safari. I mean, it should work with Safari. Uh, info at spotgamma.com and we'll respond to you with a founder's note. I was unable to attach one here as a file. So um, oh, it looks like there's a weird thing. You know, let me try this real quick. Lorna, I uploaded something. Uh, like a dummy, I just left it called src.doc.pdf uh, via the upload function here. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to learn the spot game in a room. Okay. So if you could link that for uh, the gentleman that uh, Mitch, excuse me, is looking for that note or anyone else that we're interested in, wants to read it, that's today's note. Um, and like I said, you get access to the old ones as well. All right. This time I'm really out. Tomorrow night we're doing the class. Uh, so please join that. And then uh, with that, there will be a special offer not only for the uh, Spot Game of Service, but also the boot camp. I would say that uh, this is a fascinating time coming up over the next week in the option space and into January. There's so much going on. So, you know, look, if, if you can... If there's a time to extract value from the options market, it's going to be the next, let's call it four weeks. Um, so that's my belief. Uh, that'll be the proof will be in the pudding there, right? All right. That's it for me. Thank you all very much. Uh, and we will see you all tomorrow night, hopefully. Be there. All right. Take care.